of shows by tertullian translated by the reverend s thelwall chapter one ye servants of god about to draw near to god that you may make solemn consecration of yourselves to him seek well to understand the condition of faith the reasons of the truth the laws of christian discipline which forbid among other sins of the world the pleasures of the public shows you who have testified and confessed that you have done so already review the subject that there may be no sinning whether through re we whether through real or willful ignorance for such is the power of earthly pleasures that to retain the opportunity of still partaking of them it contrives to prolong swilling ignorance and bribes knowledge into playing a dishonest part to both things perhaps some among you are allured by the views of the heathens who in this matter are wont to press us with arguments such as these one that the exquisite enjoyments of ear and eye we have in things external are not in the least opposed to religion in the mind and conscience, and, two, that surely no offense is offered to God in any human enjoyment by any of our pleasures, which it is not sinful to partake of in its own time and place, with all due honor and reverence secured to God. But th this is precisely what we are ready to prove that these things are not consistent with true religion and true obedience to the true God. There are some who imagine that Christians, a sort of people ever ready to die, are trained into the abstinence they practice, with no other object than that of making it less difficult to despise life, the fastenings to it being severed, as it were. They regard it as an art of quenching all desire, for that which, so far as they are concerned, they have emptied of all that is desirable, and so it is thought to be rather a thing of human planning and foresight than clearly laid down by divine command. It were a grievous thing, forsooth, for Christians, while in continuing in the enjoyment of pleasures so great, to die for God. It is not as they say. Though if it were, even Christian obstinacy might well give all submission to a plan so suitable, to a rule so excellent. Chapter 2 Then again, every one is ready with the argument that all things, as we teach, were created by God and given to man for his use, and that they must be good as coming all from so good a source but that among them are found the various constituent elements of the public shows such as the horse the lion bodily strength and musical voice it cannot then be thought that what exists by god's own creative will is either foreign or hostile to him and if it is not opposed to him it cannot be regarded as injurious to his worshippers as certainly it is not foreign to them Beyond all doubt, too, the very buildings connected with the places of public amusement, composed as they are of rocks, stones, marbles, pillars, are things of God, who has given these various things for the earth's embellishment. Nay, the very scenes are enacted under God's own heaven. How skilful a pleader seems human wisdom to herself! especially if she has the fear of losing any of her delights, any of the sweet enjoyments of worldly existence. In fact, you will find not a few whom the imperiling of their pleasures rather than their life holds back from us. For even the weakling has no strong dread of death as a debt he knows is due to it by him. While the wise man does not look with contempt upon pleasure, regarding it as a precious gift in fact the one blessedness of life whether to philosopher or fool now nobody denies what nobody is ignorant of for nature herself is teacher of it that god is the maker of the universe and that it is good and that it is man's by free gift of its maker 
but having no intimate acquaintance with the highest, knowing him only by natural revelation and not as his friends, from afar off and not as those who have been brought near to him. Men cannot but be in ignorance alike of what he enjoins and what he forbids in regard to the administration of his world. They must be ignorant, too, of the hostile power which works against God, and perverts to wrong uses the things his hand has formed. For you cannot know either the will or the adversary of a God you do not know. We must not, then, consider merely by whom all things were made, but by whom they have been perverted. We shall find out for what use they were made at first, when we find for what they were not. There is a vast difference between the corrupted state and that of primal purity. Just because there is a vast difference between the Creator and the corrupter. Why, all sorts of evils, which as indubitably evils even the heathens prohibit, and against which they guard themselves, come from the works of God. Take, for instance, murder, whether committed by iron, by poison, or by magical enchantments. Iron and herbs and demons are all equally creatures of God. Has the Creator withal provided these things for man's destruction? Nay, he puts his interdict on every sort of man-killing by that one summary precept, Thou shalt not kill. Moreover, who but God, the maker of the world, put in its gold, brass, silver, ivory, wood, and all the other materials used in the manufacture of idols? Yet has he done this so that men may set up a worship in opposition to himself? On the contrary, idolatry in his eyes is the crowning sin. What is there offensive to God, which is not God's? But in offending him it ceases to be his, and in ceasing to be his, it is in his eyes an offending thing. Man himself, guilty as he is of every iniquity, is not only a work of God, he is his image. And yet, both in soul and body, man has severed himself from his Maker. For we did not get eyes to minister to lust, or the tongue for speaking evil with, or ears to be the receptacle of evil speech, or the throat to serve the vice of gluttony, or the belly to be gluttony's ally, or the genitals for unchaste excesses, or hands for deeds of violence, or the feet for, a, for an erring life. Or was the soul placed in the body that it might become a thought factory of snares and fraud and injustice? I think not. For if God, as the righteous exactor of innocence, hates everything like malignity, if he hates utterly such plotting of evil, it is clear beyond a doubt that of all things that have come from his hand, God has made none to lead to works which he condemns, even though these same works may be carried on by things of his making. For in fact, it is the one ground of condemnation that the creature misuses the creation. We therefore, who in our knowledge of the Lord have obtained some knowledge also of his foe, who, in our discovery of the Creator, have at the same time laid hands upon the great corrupter, ought neither to wonder nor to doubt that as the prowess of the corrupting and God-opposing angel overthrew in the beginning the virtue of man, the work and image of God, the possessor of the world, so that he has entirely changed man's nature, created like his own for perfect sinlessness, into his own state of wicked enmity against his Maker, that in the very thing whose gift to man but not to him had grieved him, he might make man guilty in God's eyes and set up his own supremacy. 
Chapter 3 Fortified by this knowledge against heathen views, let us rather turn to the unworthy reasonings of our own people. For the faith of some, either too simple or too scrupulous, demands direct authority from Scripture for giving up the shows, and holds out that the matter is a doubtful one, because such abstinence is not clearly and in words imposed upon God's servants. Well, we never find it expressed with the same precision. Thou shalt not enter circus or theatre, thou shalt not look on combat or show. As is plainly laid down, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not worship an idol, thou shalt not commit adultery or fraud. But we do find that that first word of David bears on this very sort of thing. Blessed, he says, is the man who has not gone into the assembly of the impious, nor stood in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seat of scorners. Though he seems to have predicted beforehand of that just man that he took no part in the meetings and deliberations of the Jews taking counsel about the slaying of our Lord, Yet divine scripture has ever far-reaching applications. After the immediate sense has been exhausted, in all directions it fortifies the practice of the religious life, so that here also you have an utterance which is not far from a plain in interdict of the shows. If he called those few Jews an assembly of the wicked, how much more will he so designate so vast a gathering of heathens? Are the heathens less impious, less sinners, less enemies of Christ than the, Jews, than the Jews were then? And see, too, how other things agree. For at the shows they also stand in the way. For they call the spaces between the seats going round the amphitheater and the passages which separate the people running down, ways. The place in the curve where the matrons sit is called a chair. Therefore, on the contrary, it holds, Unblessed is he who has entered any council of wicked men, and has stood in any way of sinners, and has sat in any chair of scorners. We may understand a thing as spoken generally, even when it requires a certain special interpretation to be given to it. For some things spoken with a special reference contain in them general truth. When God admonishes the Israelites of their duty, or sharply reproves them, he surely makes reference to all men. When God threatens destruction to e Egypt and Ethiopia, he surely precondemns every sinning nation, whatever. If reasoning from species to gen genus, every nation that sins against them is in Egypt and Ethiopia, so also, reasoning from genus to species, with reference to the origin of shows, every show is an assembly of the wicked. Chapter 4 Lest any one think that we are dealing in mere argumentative subtleties, I shall turn to that highest authority of our seal itself. When entering the water, we make profession of the Christian faith in the words of its rule, we bear public testimony that we have renounced the devil, his pomp, and his angels. Well, is it not in connection with idolatry, above all, that you have the devil with his pomp and his angels? From which, to speak briefly, for I do not wish to dilate, you have every unclean and wicked spirit. If, therefore, it shall be made plain that the entire apparatus of the shows is based upon idolatry, beyond all doubt that will carry with it the conclusion that our renunciatory testimony in the layer of baptism has reference to the shows, which through their idolatry have been given over to the devil and his pomp and his angels. We shall set forth, then, their several origins, in what nursing places they have grown to manhood. Next, the titles of some of them, by what names they are called. Then, their apparatus, with what superstitions they are observed. Then, their places, to what patrons they are dedicated. Then, 
the arts which minister to them, to what authors they are traced. If any of these shall be found to have had no connection with an idol god, it will be held as free at once from the taint of idolatry, and as not coming within the range of our baptismal ab abjuration. End of chapter 4